So welcome everyone to our December 1st PTO meeting. It's, it's amazing to me that it's December 1st. I hope everyone enjoyed the recent Thanksgiving break. It was certainly appreciated by a lot of people and you know we're actually happy to be back. Not thrilled especially to be full remote, but we hope that changes in the near future. We have a pretty full agenda today, which is exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing the presentations. Just one quick note, you'll notice that Girls United with Melissa Boletto is listed third on the agenda. We're actually moving that to the end because she has two students who will be joining her and they didn't want to miss their first period class. So we're tweaking the agenda a little bit. So we'll still cover everything just in a little bit of a different order. So our first update is from our PTO president, Kyler, it's all yours. Hi, um, thank you for um, coming this morning. We saw a huge uptake in um, the payment of dues last week, the last month after we reached out during the meeting. And I just wanna continue to urge people to pay their dues. Um, we are trying to come up with some ways to show our appreciation to the teachers and the staff um, in the next um, month or so. And the funds actually definitely do help us do that. Um, I don't have much else to report, but I want to turn it over to Jan Scott, who's been organizing um, our blood drive. As you may know, the PTO helps um, support the two blood drives the school does every year. They're a little different this year. Um, and Jan is going to tell you how we're going to help out at least at the first um, one this year. Morning. Um, since we're unable to host our blood drive this fall in um, at hand, we've partnered with the Red Cross and First Congregational Church of Madison to sponsor their blood drive that they were holding on December 30th from 8.30 to 6. Uh, we hope to get student, uh, college, parent, volunteers, and donors to help support them in their effort to collect blood. They're in a desperate need for blood, and um, blood will also be tested for COVID antibodies. And if there are antibodies there, it will be provided to people uh, for convalescent plasma, which would be a great benefit. And you would find out if you had COVID antibodies um, as well. So donors can sign up at the Red, Red Cross Blood.org um, website, or you can go and there's a app called Blood Donor American Red Cross that you can sign up and just search for the event on December 30th, it's at um, the First Congregational Church of Madison. And then um, we will also send out some more information and a sign up genius for volunteers who want to do two hour shifts at the site and help out with the canteen and registration and taking temperatures. So hopefully we can show our support since we're not able to do our hand event and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. You're muted, TJ. I didn't follow my own rules. I actually said something really enlightening there, so I'll have to try and remember it. But I do appreciate the updates from the PTO. Hopefully we'll have a little different or normal blood drive in the spring, but this is still a great cause. So Jan, thanks for your time. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nurse Lesnick, your monthly appearance on COVID-19. And just a reminder, we can talk probably for hours about COVID-19. If you have any specific questions, feel free to send an email to Nurse Lesnick. She'll certainly respond. We won't have time in today's meeting, but she just has some current updates just as to where we are. So Nurse Lesnick. Thank you, TJ. Um, welcome, everybody. I don't think I've gotten this much time at a PTO meeting since I was a PTO president at Island like 100 years ago. So I don't know if it's good or bad that you want me back, but um, thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Um, not, a, not a huge update, but what I do want to emphasize, if you've had any contact with me um, in the past month, um, it's, a, it's a different uh, conversation than what you know we would normally be having with the school nurses. Um, I am aware when somebody, or I'm made aware by the DPH, if somebody in our community, in our homes, that any parents, any siblings of our Daniel Hand students have a COVID infection, 
So it might feel a little bit invasive if I'm calling you to say, hey, I heard somebody in your house has COVID infection. It really is important for us to know that um, and be part of the conversation with you so that I can, I can guide you, I can um, offer any support that, I, that you may need to help run a quarantine in your home, run an isolation in your home, but also how does that affect your Daniel Han student or your Paulson student or Jeffrey Arison, whatever school your child may go to. But you know, how does it affect that student coming back into the building? We do need to know if you have a child who's quarantined at home um, or you know, any member of your family's quarantined so that we know whether that student should be back in the building. While your kids are not currently at hand right now, it's really important. And I know, again, I know it's invasive for the school nurse to be asking you about your family's uh, health care. But you know, for this, we really do need the help with the contact tracing. We need to know uh, who should and shouldn't be in the building. And hopefully, you know, we'll be returning next Monday. That would be awesome if we could do it. But open dialogue and transparency is the key to keeping us in school, keeping our kids in school. So as long as we know who is what, what homes are affected in the community, um, you know, not, there's no stigma attached to it. It's just we need to know so that we can make sure that everybody coming back into the building is supposed to be here, is safe, has been appropriately, um, you know, is screened for health issues and, uh, and that their return is safe so that we can continue to stay in school. So uh, my phone is always available, probably more, more than, um, more, more than I, I've ever thought it would be. Um, but I will email, I will respond to emails in the evening if you have questions. I really want people to feel comfortable contacting their health offices. Um, so, you know, any questions that you have, anything that you need to uh, work through, I'm happy to help you. But really, we do ask that you let us know if your kid is sick, if your kid is waiting for a test, they shouldn't be coming to school if they have a pending COVID test. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it, I think. If you have any questions, holler, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Important information and being invited back is certainly a compliment. So take it the right way. I'm sure we'll talk often. And Stephanie did mention Monday, you know, a possible return date, if you recall, when Dr. Huh. Patty Foote sent out the message to the school community that we were going full remote, she did mention that on December 4th, they would reevaluate, you know, the metrics with COVID-19 and then make a decision as to what the next steps are and our next model will be. So I'm sure she'll mention that briefly this evening at the Board of Ed meeting. We're all anxious for an announcement on Friday. It might carry over the weekend. You know, it all depends on the metrics, but our fingers are crossed that we can return back to the hybrid model sooner than later. But that December 4th- Hi, was, how are you? That was an, an important piece just to keep in mind. So that's why Nurse Lesnick mentioned that part. So now I'm going to turn this over. We're, we're not skipping Girls United. We, again, we just moved that to a different part of the agenda, but we are getting some updates from Jennifer Hawley, who is our program coordinator in our guidance department. And there's a lot of good updates that she is going to share. Jen, thanks for your time. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share some updates about things that our, our guidance department are doing. Um, we did mention last month about uh, Wellness Wednesday, and we did have our first Wellness Wednesdays um, already one was in person and, and unfortunately the second one was virtual, but we did have um, 30 minutes on that those two Wednesdays for students to unwind and staff and the first day when we were here in the building. I think we can all agree that it was a pretty a nice light half hour. I think people felt good afterwards. Um, we had a lot of activities going on different teachers different um, departments did some fun things for the students. People were outside. Uh, it just it was a good feeling in the building. And um, we hope to continue that starting when we return, hopefully in person, as you said, um, once the second trimester starts. And we did do a 30 minute um, virtual Wellness Wednesday, obviously less activities. We are trying to plan some in case we are out and going to be virtual. We're trying to um, plan some things with different departments and um, move forward that way if we need to. But um, it, even if it's a half an hour to do nothing for the kids to, you know, again, go outside at home or, you know, take a breather. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's a positive thing. Most of this stuff 
and we will um, move forward with that, hopefully throughout the year. So um, that was a good thing. Virtual support. Our counseling and support staff are going to continue to provide virtual support to our student for our students. Um, thank you, TJ, for sharing that. So we are available every day um, in before school and after school through Google Classroom, uh, Google Meet, I'm sorry. And we're also available during the lunch waves. So there is a support staff member available. We have posted this on our Google pages, websites, and around the building for when the students are here. And um, we will continue to do that throughout the year. Again, it's just a good time for the students to check in with us. Um, for example, I'm available Monday mornings if maybe a student had a bad weekend or just wanted to kind of touch base. It's a good way for students to be able to do that. I know that many mentioned, you know, their schedules are full. So it's a good way for them to ask questions or just talk to somebody if they need to. So we will continue to do that throughout the year. And if we need to add hours, we will, but we will continue with the lunch wave and before and after school. Um, counselors have met with or are trying to meet with um, all of our ninth grade students. We started this prior to you know, going remote and um, I would say we probably got to at least half of the freshmen just to talk about credits, to talk about clubs and activities that are available and, and how to do that. Um, but then we went remote, so we're trying to do it through Google, and some students aren't attending. I get it. Um, we're sick of the computer. The last thing they want to do is probably log in and, and see a counselor or talk to us about, you know, they're not really sure what it's about. So we're going to continue to try, and we're really hoping that we come back next week and we can see them in person. So we will plan to see at least all of the freshmen before the winter break, if we haven't met with them already. Um, 11th graders, we every year meet with our juniors, a family meeting to talk about you know future planning, college planning. This year we're going to do that a little bit differently. We are going to break that up a little bit because the meetings tend to be 45 minutes to an hour long and who knows if we're going to be doing them virtually. We want to um, break that up a little bit so we can, some of the stuff we can do with just students and we're going to do that with them and we're also going to make some videos. So our counselors are going to make videos maybe about testing. I know one of our videos will be, and we'll post that on our Google pages and also on our Google um, guidance webpage for parents to be able to see as well to, again, eliminate having to maybe talk about that in the meeting. Certainly parents can ask questions about testing, but it's just one less large topic that we would have to discuss in the meeting. Um, we're also going to try to meet with the juniors again, in small groups, just the students, to talk about Naviance and how to use that in the college process. Um, it's definitely a little bit different. So we will show them that because again, it will take away from us having to do that in the parent meeting. So we are breaking that up and we're in the process of doing that. And again, if we have to do it virtually, we'll send all of our guides home. We have um, printed out you know, junior guidebooks that we have and we'll send those home if we have to, if we're not going to see the students in person, and we'll do virtual meetings. So we will still do these. They may look different, um, and we'll figure it out, just like everybody else with everything else. So um, that's something else that we're working on. One other thing I know that the support staff and I are working on right now is parent webinars that may be done probably more during the school day, maybe at 10 o'clock. They'll, they'll vary. The times will vary. We'll have a panelist. Um, I know that Mr. Schreiber is working on one right now for hopefully next week or the week after to answer any questions that parents may have um, just in regards to mental health. And so we're working on that and that is kind of to be determined and we will keep you posted as soon as I have more details. And I guess I would say the last thing is the counselors were continuously updating our Google Classrooms um, posting, you know, for seniors, blue forms and videos and links. So students are getting that information and um, grades 9 through 12, we have them set up for our own students. So it's a nice way to communicate with the kids and we will continue to do that and try to be as creative as we can to share all of our information. So that's where we are right now in guidance land. 
great updates, Jen. I know it's a little more challenging in the virtual world, but at least we'll be able to do everything we're expecting to do even when we're in person. Jen did mention the parent seminars, you know, that we are actually planning. I believe the first one is December 10th. Once I have that confirmed, I will send that out to the school community and hopefully parents will be able to attend. If not, we will record it and send out the actual meeting as well because that's proven to be pretty valuable over time. Just a quick, and Jen, thank you very much. I know you have a few other things going on today, so if you have to exit the meeting, I certainly respect that. Just a reminder, we're at the end of the trimester. You know, we end on Friday, so we have end of trimester assessments that begin tomorrow and they go through Friday. And then we transition to trimester two on Monday. We obviously aren't going to have kids in the building on, today, on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. So students do need to check in from the campus to know what their schedule is going to look like for trimester two. I've been working with the administration and the coordinators on a plan for distribution and collection of materials, which is a really important piece. We just don't know exactly what that model is going to look like next week. I'll send that information out. I mean, if you're in a three trimester course, it's not going to impact you at all. But if you have a new course, for example, that starts on Monday, there are materials most likely associated with that course that we have to get to students if they're not back in the building. And likewise, for students who are finishing a trimester one course where there are materials that are owned by the school, we're going to have to collect those as well. And it's a pretty big undertaking. We have two preliminary plans we're going to finalize today and then we'll use whatever one works best. I will say the hybrid model, it works very effectively and efficiently. If we're all remote, it's certainly doable, but it is a great challenge. Now, transitioning to a little longer, really important part of this presentation, I asked Mr. Bodner to join us, who is not at our location today. I think most people know Mr. Bodner is serving as the interim Brown Intermediate School principal in Mr. Henderson's absence. Mr. Henderson is doing really well. I spoke with him the other day. We miss Mr. Bodner, but I'm sure he's doing great work at Brown with the younger students. He is here to speak with you today about something titled Portrait of a Graduate. And this is information that's statewide. It's not Madison Public Schools only. This is a statewide expectation that impacts all students in the class of 2023 and beyond. So if you have a current junior or a current senior, this does not apply. But any students who are in the sophomore class and younger, this applies moving forward. So I'm going to hopefully transition the share screen, Mr. Bodner, so I could do this right. And then once you see it, you can get started. And I do appreciate your time. I understand we're pulling from your time at Brown right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, TJ. So as TJ explained, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the work of a lot of people throughout our district K-12 that's occurred in over the past year as we try to be compliant with the new state statute. So last fall, our district embarked on a review of our 21st century capacities matrix, which was driven by a new statutory requirement that requires, as TJ said, our 10th graders and 9th graders and students beyond to earn an additional credit during their time in high school. So in order to be compliant with this, you see that the students have to, before graduating, earn one credit of a, of a mastery-based diploma assessment, or essentially they need to acquire a one credit mastery-based diploma assessment that is aligned to a portrait of a graduate. So as I was previously mentioning, our district had since 2014, a 21st century capacities matrix that we began a review of. The reason we began that review was to be compliant with the statutory requirement in addition to an upcoming NEASC accreditation visit. So a portrait of a graduate as is displayed on the screen is defined as a description of skills and knowledge a student will need to acquire over the the course of their K-12 education career in order to succeed in an ever-changing global society. So for our students at hand, when our committee reviewed our capacities matrix, also looked at the work of other districts um, in Connecticut, the work of you know, school districts throughout the country, 
we really be, looked into to identify what we thought it was that a Madison Public School student needed to be able to do by the time they graduated. And if TJ proceeds to the next slide, you'll see that ultimately what was not expected was we came upon the same competencies that already existed in our 21st century capacities matrix. And you know, we went through a, a, a really a, a rigorous process with people throughout the district, the initial committee that began meeting last fall and through the early winter consisted of 28 people across the district and included stakeholders from all levels, parents, students, um, teachers, administrators, board of education members. And we really started by just describing what we thought were the skills that would be important for a student in an, a rapidly changing world to demonstrate as an adult. As they leave our school system and go out into the world, what we would want them to be capable of doing. And we really asked people to write, um, you know, initially off the top of their head what those skills would be. We then, in addition, looked at some of the materials I previously mentioned and came to these five competencies that we felt that a Daniel Hand graduate needs to be able to think critically, think creatively, collaborate, communicate, to demonstrate self direction, and to be able to think globally. The next slide just shows a visual representation of this, and I think it really captures the, the, the meaning of the portrait of a graduate, that this is something that takes deep roots through a, ch a child's education, starting in kindergarten. And in Madison, if you're unaware, you know, since we developed the 21st century capacities matrix in 2014, all of our curricular work, K-12, has been aligned to that matrix. The fact that our competencies did not change um, actually works really well in the sense that we actually collapsed, and in our next slide we'll get to the matrix, we collapsed the matrix and essentially brought it from having five competencies and below it, there were previously under each competency, three capacities. As you can see now, there are two. That was not that we thought that students needed to learn less going forward. It was really a process similar to writing a good research paper. You write something, you put it down, you go back later to review it and say, okay, were we redundant in places that we didn't need to be? Are we kind of saying the same thing? And we took the feedback that we gathered from faculty and from students regarding those previous capacities and where at times it was difficulty deciphering between them. And as you can see, that group of 15 capacities has now been really um, reduced to 10. But again, in saying they've been reduced, they've really been cleaned up and made clearer and I think are streamlined from our previous version. Now, again, moving ahead, the work that has gone on for the last six years in our district with the curriculum has all been aligned, thankfully, you know, to those competencies. And looking at this requirement again, we had to then look at, we have a portrait now, a, an idea of what we believe all of our graduates should be able to demonstrate by the time they're walking across the stage and shaking Mr. Salutary's hand and receiving their diploma. So now we have to look at, well, what does that actually translate into? and What does that mean at Daniel Hand High School? So at hand, by the time our students graduate, and again, this begins with our current 10th grade class of 2023, student will need to have earned a half credit in personal finance and a half credit in our independent project course. Now, presently, these were two courses that were electives of choice that students, again, are now going to be required to take prior to their graduation. The reason that the committee, a high school committee that worked over this and, and took the work of the broader based district wide committee and worked on it over the summer came to the conclusion of these two courses was we didn't feel that requiring students to do a full credit of an independent project course would be of tremendous value for the fact that we realized that 
you know, the independent project course for some students is going to be a little bit uncomfortable as they will be obviously working and doing a lot of work on their own with the guidance of a teacher and classmates. But we also wanted to look at what is something that truly in an ever-changing world is a constant and something that would benefit all of our students. And therefore, we, we came upon personal finance as a requirement. And our personal finance course, as described in the next slide, is a, a course that really takes students through a just a range of financial topics and things that they need to know about for the rest of their life in, in order to be able to plan ahead to be um, financially stable and financially sound. It's a fantastic course where students learn everything from stocks, bonds, mutual funds, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks, to again, how to appropriately save the money that they're earning through those vehicles, as well as other strategies and things that they can do to put themselves again on sound financial ground. And ultimately, it's not about, you know, with this course, it's not necessarily about, you know, we're trying to make you focus solely on money, but obviously it's something that we all need to survive. And in addition, it's something that the more knowledge we have at a younger age, the better decisions we can make in our life going forward. This course is aligned to our portrait of a graduate and to our capacities matrix that previously existed and therefore you know, fulfills that state requirement that it is something that is aligned its curriculum to the portrait of a graduate. The independent project course is one that you, know, you may not be as familiar with. It's a course that we started here at the high school, off the top of my head, I believe maybe four years ago at this time. And it is an elective really, you know, unlike any other course that we have at Daniel Han, as again, it's one that is guided by the student. And in this course, in the next slide, we'll kind of bullet point the details of the class. A student designs and completes an independent project related to a personal interest. They ultimately create a product, which is the third bullet point that showcases their new learning and personal growth. And in doing so, they share the knowledge, skills, and insight gained through this process. And it is directly related to um, the portrait of a graduate and is a course that because of its nature, as you can see, it is a pass-fail course. So it is one that, um, you know, recognizing that students have a variety of interests and will take a variety of different approaches. It's one that the pressure of them worrying about, you know, did they get an A, an A minus, or a B plus is not there. But it is a class that, again, will really be one unlike any other class they've had to this point as a student, and one that will really, um, I, I think, help them not only identify areas of potential interest that they may, may want to further explore post high school, but really help them gain the confidence of standing in front of a group, explaining the project and the choice that they made and ultimately what they learned from it. Over the years, as I mentioned already, you know, what students have done and produced in this course has been a broad range of topics from students designing projects that um, you know, deal with helping the community to film projects to you know, one student last year, I recall did a project on small houses that would be able to um, help people who you know, do not want to take on a large mortgage, but want a home of their own. And um, again, was something that was incredible experience for the student. And really it's something that also teaches everyone who's in that class a lot as well. At this time, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that anyone may have. I have a question, Mr. Bodner. Yes. Uh, my name is Tina Babarvik. I have a ninth grader. With the independent project, um, how do they know when to initiate it? And if it's an ongoing thing through the four years of school, um, you know, how, how does one, when do they initiate and how does, it, how does it begin, I guess is my question. 
Right, great question. So the independent project course would be a course that the student would take during the 11th or 12th grade. So it will not be a project that they work on for four years, but they will work on the project during the one trimester that they are enrolled in the class. The classes will range between 16 to 18 students in a section with a teacher, and the class will meet daily where the teacher will you know, generate some activities at the start of the course to help students try to I think identify what it is that they would want to do their project on, what it is that they value. And then through the course, the teacher as well as the classmates can brainstorm together, bounce ideas off one another, and really help one another in um, you know, kind of guiding themselves through the project that they've chosen. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Mr. Bodnar, it's Paula Steer. I had a quick question. Um, is there any way, rather than waiting till 2023, if we could create a club or maybe a stock market stimulation part of that class and offer it to our juniors and seniors um, or incorporate it somehow into a presentation where the students can oversee these requirements for financial stability as they graduate? Our, our current juniors and seniors do have the ability to take personal finance. That, that is a course that we've offered yeah. during their four years at the high school. And I would highly recommend, as you're asking, that you know, if, if a student's looking for an, an extra elective over the next two years, um, that is again, not a member of the class mm -hmm. of 2023, that they consider personal finance, certainly. I think it yeah. um, is invaluable. It's a reason that the, the group you know, looked at that course and, and thought it would be a great course to start with as you know, another um, piece of the portrait of a graduate. And I would, again, make, want to make it clear that that is a course that will be continued to be offered to our current um, junior class. And if a student is a senior right now, they can certainly you know, schedule an appointment or meet with their guidance counselor and look at the remainder of their schedule this year if they have the ability to fit it in. I appreciate that, but I'm, my question was more the material that was available. Could you put it into a club to you know, do a stock market simulation, especially for those who haven't had the opportunity to take the financial class? Okay, it's something we could certainly look into and talk with Mr. Tommaso in the business department. That way, and a lot of folks haven't had the opportunity to take it. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks, Mr. Bodner. And really exciting information. That's just a piece of the program of studies for the 21-22 school year that we will start the process of scheduling in mid-January. And in fact, our a big majority of our January PTO meeting will talk about the other changes to the program of studies that I do think most people will find very interesting. Mrs. Witcher, along with a few coordinators, will be presenting that information. And if you have a student who is currently in a sophomore, when they get their course request forms, the personal finance independent project, that those courses will actually be identified on course request forms. And I've been having some preliminary discussions with Jennifer Hawley already about what the scheduling process is going to look like for this upcoming year. And obviously it's going to be very dependent upon whatever model we're in. If we're all out, we'll have to do something very differently. Ideally, we're standing in front of smaller groups of students and explaining these new changes that go into effect for next year. But if you can attend the January meeting, that would be excellent because again, Mrs. Witcher and company are going to go over a lot of other exciting changes of the program of studies. And if you Recall, we start the process of scheduling early in January, and Mr. Bodner gets right into the programming side early in February for the 21-22 school year. So Mr. Bodner, thanks for the time. I certainly appreciate it. Feel free to go attend to the Brown School, and you know we look forward to your return, but enjoy Brown School for now. And almost perfect timing, Katie and Callie joined us after period one. Melissa Boletto and two students, Kaylee Richard, Katie Biner, or Callie, excuse me, Callie, and Katie Biner are going to talk about Girls United. So Melissa, take it away. And I do have the video ready. So you tell me if you want to show it after you're done or just let me know when. 
You have to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, first, I just want to thank uh, TJ and the PTO for inviting me to um, talk about the great work that these girls have been doing. Um, what my goal for this group, which is called Girls United, is really to empower them to support each other, to support other girls in the school community, and also to support the greater community, um, which they have really flourished at doing this year and last year. Um, so because my goal is to really empower them, that's why I invited Katie and Callie, my co-presidents, so that they can really do the presentation on this. Um, <clears throat> I would rather you guys hear from their voices than from mine. So Katie and Callie, thank you guys for coming. I know you guys have a busy day, so I appreciate it. And Katie, do you wanna give a little intro to the video? Yeah, of course. So hi, I'm Katie. Um, I'm a junior and I'm co-president with Callie at Girls United. Um, so this year, something that I did over quarantine is I reached out to the Madison Senior Center and they have a pen pal program that high schoolers can do with seniors there. Um, and I met my pen pal, his name is Steven, and we sort of got to talking about, you know, what Callie and, and Melissa and I do with Girls United and it's something that he's also passionate about and he does these paintings um, in a series of inspirational women. So we sort of talked about how we could work together to, you know, inspire the girls in our group and also girls in our community. So that's sort of where this project came from. No worries at all. <laughs> so basically, just a little bit about what we do other than that. Um, we, I've grown a lot this year since the summer we gained about 20 members and something that we tried to do is instill a supportive community within um, girls in our hand community and then sort of bring that further into the community with um, community service and outreach. So we do community meetings once a month and we talk about sort of topics of general impact of what girls struggle with. We're doing one um, coming up about toxic relationships and domestic violence and working on a project um, to sort of fundraise and bring care packages to domestic violence victims in emergency rooms. So that's what we're um, coming up to. We are hoping to do a project with education throughout the school about noticing the signs of emotional abuse and sort of connecting it to domestic violence within our community and sort of doing that in a virtual way because I know it's hard right now to connect. So I think that that could be a good way that we can connect, sort of share virtual posters and tips and information about that. And um, we're working on, we're in the process of doing a fundraiser with either grant or mottos um, to raise money for the sort of community outreach part of that. And then Callie, if you want to talk about what we've already done. Yeah, hi, I'm Callie, um, I'm a senior. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna speak a little more on some of the other projects we've done. So over the summer, as our club was um, growing um, quite a bit, we uh, did and created workshops for the Arts Barn. So the Arts Barn had a week long uh, day camp for, um, it was all girls. And so um, we created and designed and then executed these uh, workshops with different themes for the girls um, ages, are really grades four through like seventh grade. So it was a pretty wide age group. Some of the topics we um, discussed were social media. That was my personal workshop that I created, had to stay safe online. Katie did one on girls supporting other girls. There was other ones on mindfulness and friendships and navigating friendships at that age. Um, and then recently, the Arts Barn reached out to us again to do um, the same thing with some of our old workshops and create new ones for their virtual kind of um, online camp uh, in the new year. And then um, since about 2017, Girls United has been um, in a partnership with, um, or really has a re good relationship with Life Haven, a women's shelter in New Haven. And so um, since 2017, we've made donations of feminine products. We've um, had given monetary donations. We've also created goodie bags for the kids there and donated baked goods. So, you know, recently in September, we used um, funds that we had from um, a 
loose change drive last year that we weren't able to um, do anything with because of COVID. So then this year we reallocated those funds. We donated the money to the shelter and then spent the money buying toys for the kids. And then just for Thanksgiving last week, we all baked virtually, you know, in our own houses and then um, gathered up the baked goods and dropped that off last week for Thanksgiving. And we can hope to continue this, you know, relationship with Life Haven throughout the years and even hopefully, you know, as I as I graduate and everything. So that's been um, a huge part of Girls United and a huge piece of our community outreach. And then lastly, you know, in wake of the pandemic, we've also been um, baking again virtually. We'll set up Zoom meetings and all bake together, and then we've donated baked goods to the healthcare workers. And of course, as unfortunately as COVID's, you know, taking a turn, we're planning on doing that again, again soon. Very Does impressive, ladies. Anyone have any questions? Or Katie, do you want to share something else? No, I was just going to say thank you for having us both. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I just want to say how proud I am of all these girls. Um, I would say Katie and Callie have been instrumental in recruiting a lot of freshmen, um, which is great, uh, which will keep this group running after they graduate. Um, I have another year with Callie, you know, this year, and then one more year with Katie. So they are really uh, mentoring the younger girls too. So that's just really inspiring. Most certainly, Melissa, thanks for sharing that. And I appreciate your commitment as well. I, I do think it's easy to lose the commitment during COVID when it's hard to be in the building and meet in person. So the fact that you are still taking this on because you're so committed with our students, you know, mostly virtually, unfortunately, is still incredibly impressive. And Katie and Callie and the rest of Girls United, you should be really proud of your efforts. You know, it's impressive just to sit here and listen to all the good you're doing. And I really appreciate the fact that you're helping mentor the freshman class and we wanna keep this going. And we'll look for some updates down the road. Hopefully we'll have an in-person PTO meeting one of these days. I also appreciate your flexibility with your schedules, you know, being able to join a Zoom that's being recorded and will be sent out to a couple of thousand people in a little while. So I certainly appreciate that, but I will add the video as well because I think it was very well done and sends an excellent message. So thank you all and you know a great way to end our pto meeting today so i appreciate everyone's time and i hope everyone has a great rest of their day if you have any questions unrelated feel free to give me a call or send me an email and again thank you all for attending today thank you tj thank you